Good day, everybody. Welcome back into the Mining Stock Daily. This is the long form episode for this week. Uh, it was a busy week, lots of corporate updates and a lot of corporate introductions, actually, new companies here on the podcast. If you missed any of those, you can feel free to go back and listen to those uh, to catch up on some of those good introductions, good companies doing some very interesting work throughout the world. Uh, this week is a two-part segment for the long form. Uh, we return with a guest with Jess of Jesse Felder of the Felder Report uh, to get some market thoughts on how he is approaching these markets as the magnificent, I guess it's not seven anymore, I guess it's like four. Uh, they continue to keep these markets propped up close to uh, those all-time highs. Will the S&P hit 5,000? We'll see. I don't know, but on the same side, we're still watching the uh, markets out of China, that HSI, maybe hits that 15,000. Uh, that'd be a scary thought. So anyways, we're watching that. In the second segment, we go in and we, we take a different spin. We're going to talk about technology in exploration and mining, a little artificial intelligence with a company called Veracio and their CEO, JT Clark. Veracio is a subsidiary of Bowert Long Year, a you know, long time service provider through the mining industry. So great conversation. In fact, uh, I learned a lot in that conversation. So I hope you will too. Special thank you to Victoria Gold, Fireweed Metals, Arizona Sonoran Copper, and Visa Silver for their continued support of the podcast this year. And if you wouldn't mind, hit that review, like, share, send, subscribe, all the things, all the constructive feedback. We greatly appreciate it. All right, everybody, here's my conversation with Jesse Felder and then JT Clark on the back half. All right, welcome into our first segment here on the weekly long form episode on Mining Stock Daily. Not, We're not going to cover a whole lot of mining stocks here in this conversation with Jesse Felder from the Felder Report. I asked Jesse to come on in to see if he could help me make sense of anything of what I'm seeing in the markets. And uh, with this kind of previous conversation we had before we press record, I don't know if we're going to make any sense of it. Listen, Jesse, we've got um, interest rates appear to be on the rise we've got a dollar on the rise uh the dollar yen is on the rise and usually when that stuff happens you would expect to see the uh equity markets kind of tilter down and uh it almost appears here that it really that s p wants to hit five thousand dollars whether it likes it or not yeah well, those round numbers are always always kind of act like magnets. You know, it's funny. I was just talking with somebody before we started recording about remember Dow ten thousand. You know, <laughs> yeah. Dow, Dow first hit ten thousand. You know, back in the late nineties or something, and then it traded around ten thousand for about a decade, right? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't going to not get there. You know, such a big round number. And I think it's the same thing with the S and P. And I think we right before the close today, we actually did hit the five thousand, so they can have their celebration. But you, mm. you know, you're absolutely right. You know, there's so many signals pointing to we should be kind of in a risk off environment. And uh, all I can say is that 99% of the equity market is in a risk off environment. It's just a handful of big stock is not even the magnificent seven anymore. There's only a handful of them that are still kind of holding the broad market up. Uh, you know, when you look under the surface, you see, you know, deteriorating breadth on almost every metric you want to look at, percent of stocks above the 50-day or the 200-day moving average, um, the stocks making new highs versus new lows, uh, the advanced decline lines, you know, they're all failing to confirm the strength in the broad indexes. And that's simply because it's really just, you know, NVIDIA, uh, you know, Microsoft, Meta, you know, a couple of, you know, stocks that have been able to continue to power higher even though the the majority of them have seemingly rolled over. Yeah, I mean those moves and those I guess I guess and you're right it's not the mag 7 anymore. I think it's the mag 4. Uh maybe by the time this airs on Friday morning it'll be the mag 2, who knows. Right. But you know though but those few equities holding up the indices. I mean you could even I guess you know they a lot of them came through earnings in the last week or two had big moves. I mean the met, the meta move after their earnings was unreal. I is any of it like 
fundamental here? Is it all just based on traders pulling those equities up, you know, one call option at a time? I think you're you're right to point to the options markets. I think there's there's you know that that's a trend we've seen over the last few years and it's it's really something new um that we haven't seen in years past in bear markets bull markets of the past is <clears throat> simply the volume of options and and you know single day options and weekly options things that you know uh weren't you know even tradable you know weren't around um back you know 10 20 30 years ago. So there's so much options activity and there's so much hedging that the dealers have to do in regards to that activity that, you know, it ends up being the the, the tail wagging the dog, right? These are derivatives right. of the equity market, which should be responding to the underlying equity market. In fact, they're driving the equity markets now. So, you know, when you have, you know, tons, for example, tons of call buying, you know, by whoever it is, re, if it's, you know, retail investors, trying to, you know, uh, create a moonshot in a meme stock or or even if it's just, you know, a major hedge fund that wants to, you know, move a price and, and buy massive amounts of call options, you know, dealers are stuck, short calls, and how do they hedge that position? They buy the underlying equity. So with a small amount of capital call buying, you can get massive leverage, force dealers to actually go buy the underlying stock, create a lot of demand for shares. And I think, you know, an example of this uh, that we're seeing in the market today is Arm. You know, had a really good earnings report, but doesn't justify a sixty percent increase in the price today, right? I mean, if it hits all its earnings numbers, it's trading at a hundred times, you know, this year's right. earnings estimate. Um, but you know, when SoftBank owns ninety percent of the shares, the 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 float is tiny. It's only ten percent of the shares that are actually available to trade. Institutions own a number of those, so those aren't really you know trading either. So you get some call option activity in a stock like that and the super low float and you get these explosive moves in the markets. And I think that is, uh, you know, does help explain what's going on because, uh, you know, it's really difficult to find, um, you know, and that's not to say Meta didn't have great earnings. They did. Um, but essentially their net income is the same as it was in 2021. You know, mm -hmm. so why is the stock, you know, so, so much higher than it was back then? Well, you got stock buybacks, you got options activities, you got all these types of things and that that kind of all work together to manipulate prices higher. Yeah. How does this kind of, is it a lot different than say cycles of, or, you know, heights of cycles past? You know, I, I keep on thinking of the, 20, the 2000 tech bubble, um, you know, 2008 real estate bubble. I mean, Actually, I was, I mean, somebody online on Twitter had the uh, scope, uh, had the, uh, the clip uh, from the big short when he's in there talking, uh, having Chinese food with the guy managing the CDO funds. And um, Steve Carell says, well, aren't you at all worried about the default rate? And he just completely doesn't care about the default rate. And we're seeing higher consumer credit card default rates, auto loan default rates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> corporate real estate yeah. foreclosures all around and it like it, it just this morning like it just like this like guess that, that scene right here this is happening now people have got to be just racking their brain thinking like why are we not concerned about this and so i guess yeah, why, the, the, why are we not concerned <laughs> well it's because the for, for literally since that time right since the great financial crisis we've all been trained to expect the fed the treasury to intervene in these markets and to come to the rescue at the slightest, you know, sign of distress, right? It was almost a year ago, we had the regional bank crisis and the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and, you know, the Fed stepped in and, and came to the rescue right away. And so that's why when you have a bank like um, New York, you know, Community Bank, that's the stock price is down, you know, whatever it is, 50, 60% this week, nobody cares. Because they they believe that the Feds you know have everything under control. Um, it's interesting though that you know you point to uh, you know these types of deteriorating signs of you know signs of deteriorating credit because I think that it's interesting to me to hear this soft landing narrative has literally morphed into a no landing narrative. Everybody thinks the economy <laughs> is just going to you know continue to power higher and and nominal GDP growth is going to continue you know in the upper single digits. Uh, while inflation continues to come down, and 
the signs under the surface are that, you know, that's a very dangerous, uh, uh, you know, thesis or, or narrative to to price into markets right now, because when you look at, you know, like mm -hmm. unemployment, for example, we have the the, um, you know, the household survey saying we're losing jobs. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the, the main headline survey says, you know, we were gaining tons of jobs. You have the divergence between GDP and GDI, you know, which one says that GDP says the economy is really strong. GDI says not really, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, yeah. we're in more recessionary territory. You look at all the regional Fed banks, uh, measures of manufacturing, and they are all way down, like down in recession territory, deep in recession territory. And so you have all these signs that say, you know, recession, we're, we're on, we could be on the cusp of recession right now. And at the same time, markets are discounting not just a soft landing, but a no landing scenario for, for the economy. I think it, it sets up a real uh, dangerous uh, environment for risk assets. Do you think more, we need to get to a point to where those reports that are published from central administrations and the government we should maybe take them with a grain of salt given that it is an election year and they're going to do anything they can to make things you know basically put lipstick on a pig yeah i don't, I don't really think that they you know they're, they're, they're manipulated but they're always revised you know many months and quarters mm. after the fact so if you've lived through any one of these recessions you know that with the 2001 2002 recession 2008-9 recession, you don't know it's a recession until nine months after the fact, uh, when they finally revise all those headline numbers that said things were great, you know, unemployment, whatever, GDP, they revise those things lower nine months after the fact, and markets are already down 50% in the cases of those last two recessions. So, you know, to, if you're if you're waiting for the data to to validate your thesis, you know, uh, you're, you're making a mistake because, uh, you know, they, they always look good uh, until they don't. And by the yeah. time they don't, that's already priced into markets. And, uh, you know, and I think that's where we are right now, where we're going to start seeing some of these things that have looked really good, you know, be revised lower, you know, GDP revised closer down to GDI and, and the, the, the unemployment numbers revised closer to the household survey figures. Okay. Uh, we had two fairly large uh, auctions today, uh, this week in, in uh, the bond market. We had a 10-year auction, a 30-year auction. Uh, both of them appeared to be okay. Uh, so not, not, nothing that really screamed out uh, one way or the other. That uh, I think Peter Bookvar wrote that seemed pretty on par with everything. Uh, but that that front end of the curve is rising once again here. That two year yield that uh, has been the bellwether for inflationary expectations that is very much trying to creep out of this range here currently at four forty five. Um, do we go back? Is this is this kind of that bellwether we need to be paying attention to here with inflation expectations once again? Is that something that's on your radar? Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, what that's being driven by is the is a lot of this data, you know, that's come in stronger mm -hmm. than expected and, and the prospect of a return of inflation, right? We're seeing, um, you know, the, with the potential uh, issues in the Red Sea and, you know, and, and trade, uh, you know, running into or having to, you know, go around, um, you know, the south southern tip of africa to get where it's going mm -hmm. you know those kinds of things are problematic i think there's um you know oil prices look to me like they're trying to put in a, an important bottom here uh they turn higher that's inflationary and then we've seen you know s um signs that you know the wages are still relatively high and i think it was ism services that showed um you know strong uh, uh indications and and also the nfib small business survey showed um, intentions for raising worker pay. Uh, and those are the types of things that the Fed doesn't want to see. Um, and, and, and they're being reflected in break evens. So you look at like, you know, uh, break evens, five year break evens, and, and t those types of things, and they've all moved higher over the last few months, suggesting that the inflation genie maybe hasn't been put back in the bottle. And uh, rates, you know, the higher for longer narrative um, has kind of made somewhat of a comeback. Uh, you know, so so I I do think we yeah, we need to pay attention to what does inflation look like? Does it come sustainably back to two percent? Because if not, you know, then then the front end is going to have to stay high because the Fed's not going to 
uh, you know, cut cut rates with the stock market at all time highs, with uh, inflation, you know, starting to look like it's going to be rekindled due to robust spending and wages and these types of things. Well, do you think that the market's finally come to terms with what the Fed said from December through January? You know, we had that quote unquote Fed pivot announcement in, in December. And then, um, you know, things started to get pretty heated. I mean, the spread between expectations for rate cuts were almost double than what the uh, Fed's the dot plot was, right? And so we yeah. spent all of January, you know, push, pushing equities higher on this expectations that there's a chance for a rate cut in March. Jerome Powell comes out last week and says there's nothing on the table for a rate cut in March whatsoever. And in fact, it seems like the posse is out there this week uh, really taking that even further, pushing that expectations later into 2024. Uh, but here we are with the market trying to get to $5,000 S&P. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a game of chicken. It's, it really seems like it's a game of chicken here. Um, yeah. You know, who, who wins? There was, well, there, there was a good um, article in the Wall Street Journal today about how investors are almost always wrong about future Fed policy, right? At the mm. at 0% rates, the bottom, you know, during the pandemic, nobody thought the Fed was gonna go to five and a half percent, right? I think estimates were like, they'll maybe go to two, right? Yeah, so right, they right. go to five and a half. And now for the last, I mean, there's been expectations for the last year that, you know, Fed was gonna stop and start cutting and they've been wrong and wrong and wrong, constantly wrong. So I think the markets are are always wrong. Investors are always wrong in regards to you know Fed policy, but I think the the big mistake that they're making today is the Fed may cut by May, um, but the only thing that's going to get them to cut is if the market goes down, you know, turns south, stock market right, goes down. We get at least 10, 20 percent to the downside. The Fed's not going to cut interest rates with stocks at all time highs. It just is too financial conditions are too loose. There needs to be some some type of uh, uh, an economic um, scare that raises the prospect of a serious rise in, in unemployment re recession. And, you know, who knows, maybe the, the commercial real estate problems that are, uh, you know, plaguing regional banks right now will start to become more of a problem over the next few months. We'll have more of these, you know, New York Community Bank, Silicon Valley Bank types, types of issues. Um, in fact, I think it would be more of the the, the uh, New York NYCB type of issue with with uh, commercial real estate, office real estate, specifically, um, you know, becoming such a problem because values the, the values of these buildings that are sitting empty have you know been cut in half in many cases, mm -hmm. right? And so they're worth less than the loan, uh, you know, on on the building, and so in in most cases, and so you know. <laughs> Uh, the banks are trying to right now, ex you know, extend and pretend that, that this isn't yeah. happening. Um, but, you know, in more and more cases, we're we're starting to realize that, uh, no, that this this problem isn't going to go away and uh, it's probably going to get worse. So I think, you know, if something like that were to worsen in a, in a way where it starts plaguing a, a larger number of banks, becoming more difficult for the feds to kind of deal with. Uh, then we could, then you could see rate cuts come on the table, but it would have to be, you know, significant enough that it really threatens the economy and employment. Um, and so I, I do think there's a chance the Fed cuts in May, but only if we see some, start to see some real financial distress uh, in in some respect or another. Uh, I I'm right there with you, and I've said this the last few weeks. I do not think that they will cut any time in the first half of the year. I was maybe thinking late in the fall unless something happened and they were forced to, and it wouldn't be just like a quarter basis point cut, it would be like a full point. Well, here, here's another point that I'll make, that uh, if you believe that we're, we're headed for a no landing scenario, then they might have to raise interest rates. Right? <laughs> exactly. If we're not going to <laughs> yeah. have any, any issues and, and the economy is gonna continue going, they might have to take the funds rate to six and a half, seven and a half percent. I think it's crazy when people talk about, you know, real rates are super restrictive right now. People don't understand that if you look back, you know, uh, uh, Jay Powell want, does, he wants to be Paul Volcker, right? He wants to do the right thing with inflation. But if you look back even to the mid seventies, the Fed funds rate on a real basis, you look at Fed funds versus um, core PCE, Fed funds rate, 
was f over 5% in the mid-70s. And that wasn't enough to really break the back of inflation. Fed funds is two and a half, not even two and a half percent above core PCE right now. So to say that is that is a really tight monetary stance, you know, is is farcical mm -hmm. because Paul Volcker took it to 10 percent. Fed funds was 10 percent above core PCE in order to really break the back of inflation. So, you know, if if uh, inflation is going to pick up again, right, the, the message is clear. Five and a half was not enough. They'll have to raise. So I, I think, you know, the people who are really thinking that we're, ha we're headed for a no landing scenario don't appreciate what that means. You know, for, that means mm -hmm. that all these expectations of, of multiple rate cuts this year are really wrong. Yeah. You know, I keep on thinking and I, and I, I contemplate and I've, I've thought this for a couple, well, for a while now, like because Jim Bianco has been out there saying that five and a half was not tight, hardly tight enough. And he's been uh, very outspoken about it. Uh, over the last year. Uh, so if five and a half wasn't tight enough, and let's say, you know, they do have to go to six and a half, hypothetically, if they do, what does this say about quantitative easing? ZERP? Was it absolutely, I mean, can we go back and just have an actual conversation about how unnecessary it was to have a zero interest rate policy for so long, knowing that the economy was absolutely just fine with three, four, five percent. Can we start having that conversation? Yeah, you know, it's it's it never happens in real time. It's always right. you know looking back on it, and I think we're starting to get to the place where if inflation proves persistent over the next few years, we're going to look back and say. QE was money printing, and it did it did what money printing always does. It creates an inflation problem. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, more people aren't talking about this because Bernanke was asked, I think, back in 2010 or 11 or something. He's testifying in front of Congress, and he was asked by, um, you know, a uh, an astute congressperson. I wish I remembered the, the name of the person um, that, okay, what? Your quantitative easing, this is, you know, buying treasury bonds. How is this not monetizing the debt? And mm. Bernanke's answer was, well, this is a short term measure to stimulate the economy. The balance sheet's going to go back down to a normal. No, we're going to normalize the balance sheet within the next couple of years. And that will prove to you that this wasn't monetizing the debt. <laughs> well, the balance sheet was like, you know, one or one trillion or something, you know, back then. And he said, you know, it was going to go back down, you know, below, below a trillion or, and, and obviously, you know, we're at eight, nine trillion or something today. So to me, by Bernanke's definition, they've been monetizing the debt for the better, you know, for, for over a decade now and monetizing the debt always leads to inflation. So we're going to look back on this, I think, you know, with a his, more of a historical mindset and realize that, um, you know, this this was, uh, you know, inflationary monetary policy um, that we've seen time and again throughout history, uh, you know, debasing, essentially debasing the, the currency. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that's what, what they've done. And uh, that's why we probably have a bigger inflation problem uh, than most people realize today. Uh, the two last topics I want to cover with you in the next few minutes that we have, Jesse. I want to ask you about China first. Uh, it's uh, Lunar New Year, so everything's pretty quiet over there. However, uh, that Hang Seng Index looks terrible. We've had a conversation about that the last couple of weeks. About uh, There's very few charts that look as bad as the uh, Canadian indices, but the Hang Seng's about there. Um, that 1500, or excuse me, 15,000 level and hang saying we've talked about a line in the sand potentially. Are you at all concerned about follow follow through or contagion from a uh, just a, a flailing Chinese market that could spread into the West? I'm not. That's not a concern uh, that I have. I think, you know, what I would be more concerned about is if you think about, you know, the problems in China, in the Chinese economy over the last year or two, and how much that has helped uh, our inflation issue here, that mm. I think what we should be more worried about is if the economy does begin to find its footing and China starts to take off again, that disinflationary global impact goes away. And you get you get an inflationary, a global inflationary impulse 
that, uh, you know, would ripple around around the world, just like, you know, it, it, it has um, in the past with, you know, China's consumption of commodities and, and all these types of things. So I think that, you know, that that is a bigger concern of mine um, from, you know, uh, the Jim Rogers in me looks at all of the negativity around China and starts to actually get excited, right? The stock market yeah, right, right, right. is incredibly cheap, you know, seven, eight times earnings uh, for companies, you know, for some some wonderful companies o o over there. Um, you know, it's it's dramatically different than the 50 times free cash flow that the Magnificent Seven trade for here. So it, the sentiment is is virtually the opposite. It's the mirror image, right? We have this euphoric mm -hmm. Uh, sentiment in the United States, which is just buy stocks, just keep buying and never, you know, and if they, they'll never go down uh, in a sustainable way. So as long as you just keep buying and hold on, you'll, 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 you know, be good over time. That mindset is just the opposite in China, where, where I think there was a Financial Times put out a thing where they polled investors at a Goldman Sachs conference. And I think m more than half of them called China uninvestable, um, mm -hmm. that there's no, no, possible rationale for buying Chinese stocks. And I think that's that's uh, an opportunity um, in my mind. Um, but like I said, I think the bigger risk is that the Chinese economy begins to find its footing and uh, that disinflationary impulse that, that it has created for the last year or two goes away. Well, if the beat up Chinese stock market interests you, I've got some gold equities for you, Jesse, that you'd be equally excited. <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, what, what's the most, it, you know, it's, it's a tie for what's the most hated uh, oh, securities, man. you know, on the planet. I think it's Chinese stocks <laughs> or gold miners. <laughs> oh, it, it's right there. Oh, it's really bad. Uh, even ni yeah. nickel equities, nickel, so I mean, all commodities. In fact, actually, this is, my la this is a good segue because my last topic is, uh, what, what I love talking about you about is because you're, you're just a generalist in more things, but you do follow the commodity sector pretty dang closely to keep an eye on what it's telling you about the strength and heartbeat of the economy. But so let's talk about copper here. Uh, I, I have I have just had my doubts about this move in copper, and obviously my ideas came kind of came into fruition. As we are speaking, it is sitting about $3, I think, 73, 70 cents a pound. So it is sitting in you know, kind of a support area. It, it almost busted through this morning, but I'm looking at this thing and I'm, I'm hearing news out of China. I'm seeing, you know, manufacturing recession here in the U S uh, foreclosures in corporate real estate, not only in the U S but also in, you know, the Chinese develop uh, uh, construction. Uh, we're also hearing some issues out of Europe. I do not see a reason to be bullish copper right now. And I think that chart confirms it. Uh, your thoughts on copper and what it's saying, what is Dr. Copper telling us? Well, if you look at a, a monthly chart, and this is the chart that I've just, you know, I've had on my, in my chart list for year, for a few years now, at least. Um, it's just formed this, this huge pennant pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Just narrowing, uh, you know, kind of coiling uh, above above kind of a, a longer term, you know, support range. And, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see which way it breaks, uh, you know, typically from a just classical technical analysis perspective, these types of patterns break in the direction of the prevailing trend, which in this case is high is higher, right? Since mm -hmm. the 2020 low, we had a big strong move higher. And then we've been essentially just coiling around this, you know, $4 level. So, uh, you know, I'm curious to see which way it breaks. I, you know, I'm a com longer term believer in a commodity super cycle. Um, I think it probably breaks to the upside. Like I said, I think, you know, the negative negativity, uh, bearish sentiment around the Chinese economy could be a really, you know, good, good contrarian indicator for the fact that they're going to finally turn this thing around and it's going to start to take off again. And if so, you know, you would expect copper prices to break to the upside. So, you know, I, that pennant pattern is something I'm watching really closely. All right. Jesse, thanks so much for your time. It's good to catch up with you once again. I know you're busy. I appreciate it. Yeah. Always a pleasure, Trevor. Thanks. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. Uh, we're going to take a quick break uh, and uh, we'll uh, leave Jesse here and then a uh, quick break and we'll be back talking about artificial intelligence in mineral drilling. It's a very fascinating conversation. So stay tuned.
All right, everybody, welcome into Mining Stock Daily's second segment of this week's long form episode. And actually, we're going to step away from markets and junior mining equities for the time being. And it's going to be a little bit of a, a kind of a curveball for us here on the podcast. And we're going to dive into technology in mining and exploration, drilling, and all those things, specifically artificial intelligence. That has been the narrative of almost everything in markets lately uh how are companies and um, you know all the like using artificial intelligence to increase production at 2023 that was really the narrative that kept all markets afloat and moving higher and that's no different as the first few early months here in 2024 but we're going to turn our attention to a company called Verasio. it's a subsidiary of Bowert Longyear obviously Bowert being one of the uh, uh top service providers and drilling and exploration uh, for mining and, and, and all resources, actually. And we're happy to welcome in the CEO of Veracio. His name is JT Clark. JT, uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's a, a yeah. fun topic. I appreciate the chance for us to you know jam a little bit and explore. Yeah. 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 I, I think I'm expecting for you to tell me how many NVIDIA chips that you are buying over and over that's keeping this market afloat. Is is, is that the story? <laughs> uh, it, it, it is certainly up there in our, our spend. Um, now, you know, debatable if I, I should be putting those towards Bitcoin mining or if I keep doing what I'm doing. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a it's a different type of product investment and a different type of purchase than maybe the, you know, steel and pumps that uh, Bort Longyear is used to. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let, let me, before we kind of dive into the technology and how AI is being uh, adopted in this specific sector, I, I want to get a sense of a little bit of a background of you. Uh, you you've got a... a Big background in natural resources, mining, oil, and gas before this role here at Verasio. Uh, you were with Boston Consulting Group for a, a number of years. So kind of talk about the evolution of your career and how you found your, eventually found yourself into this position. Yeah. Um, look, I, it, it, it's, it's been a wild ride. Um, I've, I've had an absolute blast in my career. Um, I'll try and uh, condense that 15 year period at, at BCG or Boston Consulting into a, a few bullets. Um, I, I joined BCG and I immediately started working in natural resources. And for me, this was the join the firm, see the world plan. Um, hmm. Had the opportunity to work with assets around the world, uh, you know, as I say it on every continent except Antarctica, um, and work with a wide variety of assets but have always had a fundamental interest in the deployment of uh, technology to support those assets. How do we, how do we, how do we execute better with the support and enablement of technology? And more recently, as you said, we all talk about the AI component, um, you know, towards the, the latter part of that career, two things happened. I, I uh, moved to Calgary um, to support the, the build out of BCG's Western Canadian uh, presence and they're really honed my focus on mining and technology in particular and at the same time we were building a data science team and i was able to carve out a portion of that data science team to focus on building ai for mineral processing and we built solutions deployed them around the world um, i subsequently through my client work got to know bort longyear they described the technology business they were building uh, they engaged bcg to help them formulate a plan for how to do that. And really, we recognized the how how these technologies had gone from concepts and incubations, and really, we, we would call it, we're ready to graduate into their own full-fledged business. And that was really the the inception of Veracio. Um, and, and then we worked together to build that, um, and I got sucked in full-time. You know, I couldn't stay away. I was just the... the opportunity was too compelling and so i made that career change and and now lead veracio okay so let's talk about what veracio is there's a number of different entities here and if you don't mind uh communicate to us like we're you know <laughs> you know juniors in high school and talk to us about what you're doing here that's really kind of leading that technology path for not only mineral exploration but also mining in general yeah, and it, it, look, that that last piece is really important. This is this is not just about exploration. So, 
what Veracio fundamentally is, is we, we drive innovation and AI applications in ore body knowledge, right? And ore body knowledge is that understanding of the ore bodies that we're looking to economically produce and being able to drive more and better information. We call it more accurate and more granular information about that ore body helps us make better decisions, whether that's on the front end on, you know, optimizing a drilling plan to explore that ore body or to find that resource all the way through to being able to optimize processing plants. Um, and so we, we fundamentally innovate at the sensor level, bringing the sensors, whether that's, that's our true scan platform and scanning them, whether those are downhole sensors, sensing from the drill string, we're looking to bring sensory capability to better understand that ore body and then pair that with cutting edge AI that allows us to be more effective in our analytics and, under, and as we seek to understand that ore body better and integrate that information into the rest of the mining value chain. Uh, and I know we can't get into the micro minutia of the data for for these ore bodies because I mean you know as much as I do that no ore body is the same as the as the next one. I mean you can compare VMS to VMS or you know porphyry to porphyry, but no ore body is an exact replica of the same. So kind of get a sense of how this data collection was originally compounded in the first kind of prototypes and how much data has kind of gone into this process you know, since that inception to really uh, improve that AI as you go and as you build. Yeah, so 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 building a robust uh, data set from which we can start to learn about other ore bodies and compare them um, is, is really important. So, you know, the, the shorthand, we've scanned millions of meters of core um, and scanned core from all sorts of different ore bodies. Now we've done We've done a lot of work in copper porphyries and, and over the recent history, there's been a strong focus on exploration and development in copper porphyries. But, and, and so we have a very robust data set around that, but we're not only focused on copper porphyries. We've done recently, we've done work in nickel, done work in lead zinc, done work in lithium, and at the same time are building out those data sets. The key thing is what we're not comparing is we're not comparing ore body to ore body. And we're not actually comparing drill hole to drill hole because even within an ore body, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity um, and those those drill holes will be different. But what we what we're doing is we're capturing data that allows us to split the ore body into millions of pieces and then find like similar pieces that allow us to better understand both the characteristics and behaviors of that ore um, and, and through the rest of the value chain. Okay. Uh, and maybe for simplicity's sake, we, you know, I because we don't want simple. the beast. Well, the beast, I don't want the BCSC to come down to me. Like you can't say or body. Let's say the deposits maybe okay. <laughs> just because we I, work with, <laughs> yes. you know, we gotta, we gotta follow rules here. I don't want to, I don't want to knock it on my door, but you know, obviously same concept here. Um, so, so talk about like adaptation or, or, or excuse me, not, not adaptation, adoption. Uh, of this technology, uh, obviously, when you when you talk about uh, adopting new technology, that it, it comes at a cost, and so I'd like to get a good understanding of who your clients are. Generally, who your clients are, uh, it, you know, are you finding this is technology that better suited for companies in production, or do you find it's better suited for early exploration type of companies. And with that as a caveat that, you know, capital is very hard to come by right now. And how are you kind of, a, you know, approaching those companies as far as, you know, getting that technology in their hands in, a, you know, financially capable to doing so. Yeah. So, um, so the, the, the simple short version is we're best suited from, let's call it late exploration, maybe resource definition through to production. Now we are developing mm -hmm. and enhancing our capability to support early exploration better, but that's the point where we know the least about the ore body, we have the least comparative data points and becomes the hardest for our approach to be effective. Um, so the earliest stage of exploration, those first drill holes, um, that, those are the most challenging for our type of application. There's not an existing data set. As we can build on that, as you get into higher volume data capture, then we have the data points that we need to be able to support our analytics. Um, so, so that's that's really 
where we're targeting now, you know, I would highlight um, because we, it's this is one we can talk publicly about. I'd highlight for end mining, um, you know, and, and some of their mm. recent announcements and press and the recognition of the role that TrueScan played in helping them to I- identify additional deposits and resource. Um, now they're not, they're not doing R and R declarations off of our data that, <laughs> right. There's, there's more to that. But what we bring is speed, accuracy, and a new level of granularity that helps them be more targeted and faster to decision making and bringing those those resources online. Okay, uh, break that down for me. Can uh, walk us through maybe a, a hypothetical or a real case study where a company adopted this and then it actually streamlined and and be, their workflow became a lot more efficient than maybe some other peers would have done without the data. Yeah, um, you know. Look, let, let me give it, I'll, I'll give an example. I'm not going to call out another Canadian deposit. I'm going to give them a little bit of time to be able to make their an, announcements. But um, there's okay. a few things that we do that enable decision making. And so as we'd worked for some time with the um, with this client, they were they were able to build the confidence in the data sets that we had, which allowed, and because we're turning around data for them um, in near real time, we call it daily delivery of data they're able to actually build a fairly dynamic model and respond to the incremental data points they have about that deposit and enhance their metal modeling in very rapid fashion. Now they'll still do their confirmatory diligence and lab assays and things like that. And, and, you know, we, we, just to be clear, we think about lab assays and TrueScan as complementary data sets. Um, now, mm. because they're able to do a lot of that modeling faster, they don't have the lag time of waiting for a lab, and they and we have indistinguishable um, levels of accuracy in the data. Um, they're able to more quickly move through their drilling program, optimize the drilling program, get their modeling done, which allows them to make decisions faster, um, and and then they can ultimately confirm that. Um, and it also helps them decrease some of their after drilling costs because they're. Their programs are shorter. They have teams engaged for less time. They 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 do fewer lab assays because they they can be more targeted. They know where where they need to get the assay to confirm the data, um, and and they know where they're in cover or non mineralized uh, rock that they don't need to assay. Um, and so mm. it, it it changes a little bit. The other thing it helps with honestly is with. We, we bring techniques to understand more than more di- more from that data than what you can get just out of geochemistry from a lab assay. Um, and to give you an example, based on you know what our technology does is as, as some of the, the listeners here may be familiar, we we bombard the core sample with X-ray energy XRF. It it releases a photon response, and we measure that photon response to determine characteristics. One of the characteristics we determine is geochemistry. But another we were able to find is an association between photon response and density. So now instead of doing geophysical evaluations on every drill hole, we were able to associate the photon response with density and be able to then map out the density for the for the entire deposit for every drill hole that we were able to scan. This is a much more um, this is much more data dense um, approach than doing selected density measurements mm-hmm. um, and allows them to build more accurate and models faster. So we're not, we're not just hunting for, you know, I, a lot of people think about our, our capabilities as driving an, a faster understanding of geochemistry. What we're really doing is looking to un, unlock the characteristics of the depositor of the ore body um, using that technology, recognizing we're not limited to geochemistry. There's more associations that we can identify and derive for our clients. Okay. Oh, man, that's absolutely fascinating. And these systems, are they on site or is this something that you you need to have that, that core of the rock shipped in, in-house? Yeah. So, so the majority of the time we go on site to our client and that's part of the speed. Okay. Shipping and logistics become a, a hurdle and a time sink for evaluating these ore bodies. Um, for some clients, we do operate out of our facilities and they will ship core into us, um, but that's more the exception than the rule. Typically, we set up, you know, either in an open air environment on site near the rigs, uh, sometimes we'll set up in the core shed. Um, we're actually working with a lot of our clients to help them adopt their workflow to facilitate the, 
the scanning facilitate speed and enable um, enable one of one of the other capabilities we bring. We've talked you know we've talked a lot about data. We haven't talked about as much about the AI yet. Is Correct. is things like AI logging of assets um, and and of core. So we'll do lithological and structural logging using our a AI based on both the photography and the geochemistry, um, or and um, that it that allows an increased level of consistency between between the geologists that are logging the core because you have a first pass from AI that's identifying the features and um, and. And be, by being able to do this and doing this on site, really what we're doing is enabling those geologists to not only be more efficient, but also focus their time on the highest value geological questions, um, you mm -hmm. know, getting into the details rather than, you know, and it releases them from doing some of the mundane activity. Um, we're able to capture that with with the AI. Well, and I think a lot of old timers ears are going to perk up. I mean, you know, people spent many years cutting their teeth logging core. Yes. <laughs> before they became vice presidents of exploration here. Are you suggesting that potentially technology like yours, you know, powered by AI could eventually um, decrease the need for those early stage geologists being in the core shack, logging core, pencil on paper? I, I think of it as as more of enhance the capability of those uh, early in their career geologists. Um, you could almost think of this as much as a a, a training tool um, and mm. a supervisory to, tool, but also one that helps those geologists both learn quickly and focus. And I I think we'd have to put this in the context of the world is the world and the educational systems around the world are producing fewer and fewer geologists. Right. We we have a, sh a shrinking workforce. We need to be enabling those teams to get up to speed faster with from and transition from classroom geology to real world geology um, and per, and and enabling them with tools like what we can bring helps them get up their curve, but also helps them have a higher scale, more impactful career. You know, and it, it, it does, it, it reduces some of the mundane, but with the advancements in AI, we can, we can train that and enable these geologists um, differently than we have in the past. All right. Well, it, and I think the for, for me, it's, oh, just, ahead, I, I, I think about it the same way as I think about, you know, if I, I, I take uh, recently took one of my, my children to the ER with a fracture, um, they do an x-ray, right? You, you know, in my youth, when I broke my arm, that was evaluated by a technician. Then it was looked at by a doctor and all that ground <laughs> ground floor work was done. Now it's done by AI, right? Now we generally trust that AI results, but I would also say, I still want the doctor to look at it, right? We think about mm. this the same way, right? We can get it. We can get a high quality first pass. It enables, it enables higher throughput, higher scale and more efficiency, but we still want, we, we still want to provide something that has human interaction or we call it human in the loop. We're not taking the human out of the loop. We're just enabling them in a different way. Uh, I think in general, artificial intelligence, the hope is that this wave of technology will increase production and growth. I mean, not just in mining, but you know, in everything, in manufacturing, computing, uh, just overall output. And so uh, I think with that in mind, what you just said, it, it fits in line with how it is increasing productivity and that's good to say but let me ask you you know what is well, this is relatively new you may you you may uh, come back to me and say no it's, it's not as new as you as you think it is having all this data set but what is you know what is lacking i guess so, you know what is the biggest challenge with this new technology into what would be a very you know historic <laughs> Uh, traditional type of uh, uh, industry that is, I guess, for the most part, um, there's always a lot of lack of, there's always pushback against adopting new technology. We've seen it in ore sorting technology. We've seen it in processing technologies. There is like, a lot of people do not accept new technologies as being something that increases value of projects they see as just more of a cash spend and margin cutter. So I guess, you know, that's a big loaded question. I guess, how would you answer? Yeah. How would you answer that JT? 
Well, look, I, I would say depends on – well, you triggered like 15 different thoughts there. That's why this question. We have time. We have time. So, so, so let, let – you know, I, I, I'm thinking about three things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll say the three, and then I'll come back to them, but this will keep me honest. One, you know, I, I do think that the mining industry has been pushing on and technology, but we get painted with a bit of an unfortunate brush in, in a lot of the public statements, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Part of that is because there we have unique hurdles in mining to adopting technology that that we have to overcome in order to do that. So let me get in. Then I'll get into the hurdles, and then I'll talk to you know this this idea of technology as a cash sink and some of the stakeholders that we're talking to, and particularly um, you know my minority shareholders, financial investors, and resource company who are actively looking to to push and drive their um, they're operating partners for more uh, adoption of technology and to accelerate that. So I certainly see an appetite from, from the market and particularly some of those minority financial only investors that don't have an operating stake that are starting to, that, that have been awakened to or seen success in part of their portfolio of technology adoption are, are, are going a little bit more throttled down on, on mm. pushing and influencing their operating companies to drive that. So, so let's start. Let's start though with a little bit of the 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 unfair brush. I'm going to call it. Um, look, mining companies have been investing in technology. This this is not new. This been investing in technology for decades. Um, the latest flavor of it happens to be called the AI. Um, even on the AI front, we've been investing in in AI. Um, look. It, it, we're not doing work with them, but I, I'll, I'll point to one that's that's big in public and, and call out tech. Tech has been investing in their race program in technology, AI de deployment and having great results from that um, for years and years and years. This is, you know, it's not a 2024. Oh, we ought to do something about AI. However, mining does have some unique challenges. Um, now, let's just do a comparison for, for the moment to. You know, a lot of what we see in the AI side right now is in social media. Um, you know, a lot of discussion of of whether it's, you know, cu customer segment of one style, um, slicing, dicing customer profiles, information about the customers to get that right offer to the right customer at the right time. A lot of this is gener you know, this is built off of a data set that is our social media. The difference mm -hmm. about that is that social media data set resets daily weekly, we generate so much data in consumer facing industries that you have a massive and public and, and generally available or acquirable <laughs> data set on which you can build AI. Well, we're triggered by we're we're triggered on almost anything every day. Yeah. Yeah. And and so and 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 we as consumers support it. We're more than happy to yeah. contribute <laughs> with our behavior to generating this massive data set that data scientists and AI can then go and interrogate. And, and you know, um, gosh, it feels like I, you know, I even talk in the in the in the general vicinity of my phone, and all of a sudden I'm starting to get ads for what I talked about. Right. So it's <laughs> clearly quite advanced. But the fundamental is a data set that refreshes, is granular and accurate, and refreshes constantly. How often do we refresh? the data set on an ore body every yeah. 30 years, 40 years, you know, occasionally we'll go back and reinterrogate historical core. How, how often do we, we change the technology with which we capture that data set happens all the time in consumer facing. We really use predominantly many of the same techniques that we've used for decades. So really what this is about is we, we have historically, we have built data sets that I would call our human centric data sets. Geochemistry, for example, wonderfully useful. AI doesn't think about a periodic table of elements. That is a human construct for us to understand geochemistry. And we have built data sets around this, these human-centric um, workflows that we have fundamentally mm -hmm. needed. Now, if you discard all that, what we need in the future is AI-centric data sets. Um, so... What, how, how this has evolved is we've been investing in technology, but we've been building an AI layer on top of human-centric data sets. This fundamentally acts as a limiter or a ceiling on the potential of AI because we are feeding AI with a data set that has gone through a human filter effectively. 
Mm -hmm. What we need to now do is build AI centric data sets that will, and that will un unshackle a little bit, the, the horsepower, the capability of the AI to be able to now unlock the full potential of the AI solutions, whether that's in mineral processing, whether that's in, in, um, understanding the deposit or the ore body, we, we now need to build a data set that is fit for the generation of tools that we're looking to use. So that, that, that fundamentally is what Veracio is looking to do. We know we need to meet the human centric data set needs of today. That's why we report out on things like geochemistry, but we also recognize that we can use that underlying data set that we're building, not constrain it, build the AI off of the the data that feeds the data that generates the geochemistry mm -hmm. and build the AI on top of that, which will allow us to better understand and make better decisions facilitated by AI, by, by AI throughout the value chain. So you got yeah. me on a little bit of a soapbox there. Uh, oh, it's great. But, it's great. But that's, you know, that that's, and it's a bit theoretical, um, but that's how we see the world. And as, as I was, you know, the very simple example, as I was in prior in my career, not with Veracio, working in mineral processing, you know, we would build beautiful, complex models integrated with expert systems around the processing plant that we would then feed a 30 meter block model into, right? Like that was all, that was the most accurate we had. And we weren't even feeding the full block model. Two data sets were being taken, right? We would, we would, even though we had done all the work in exploration, to understand, not we, the, the mining company had done all the work to understand sure. the ore, ore body or the deposit in the exploration phase, they would resample at production and then they would feed in head grade and hardness, right? We, we basically do a, a, you know, a quick turn lab assay feed two characteristics into this highly complex model on a 30 meter basis when a shovel, shovel or truck size is probably like the equivalent of a two meter block model. So, we have a lot of interpolation. There's a lot of error. You feed error into an AI-driven system, now you've hit the ceiling. You are limit on, limited on the potential. What we need to do is start to unlock that error, get the accuracy and the granularity to meet the capability of the technology system in the production environment. Yeah, uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and you mentioned you're getting a little theoretical. Well, I was going to follow up with a theoretical uh, question of regarding, listen, I mean, you're learning a lot about deposits, construction of variable types of deposits. Are you, you know, are, are programs such as Verasio and, and your peers in this industry, are we unlocking a better understanding that maybe we uh, have thus been, un, have been unrealized basis on the formation of the earth's crust in general, like if things we just, maybe theorize before, but just couldn't prove, but with this technology and with this artificial intelligence power, we're starting to actually understand if some of those theories were right or wrong. Yeah, I, I, I think um, we're, we are on that track. Um, I, I don't think it's as, as simple as right or wrong. I think what we're doing is generating data sources that we can feed back into the big thinking and be able to refine yeah. those theories, right? I, I, you know, it's, it's not as simple as, as right or wrong, but as you know, for example, um, let, let, let's give an example. We, when, when we're evaluating a core sample, we'll basically get a, a nearly complete elemental profile. Um, we bring in technology that allows us to get light elements down all the way to sodium and heavy elements up to uranium. And so, and with some some exceptions that are known out there around limitations around gold and some others, you build a very complete mm -hmm. view, but then you also do it on a granular scale. The the you know where where typically we might sample on a, a meter average, um, it, through a lab, um, we the 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 highest resolution that has been useful for a client so far has been a one and a half centimeter resolution. So you're getting you're starting mm -hmm. to get full elemental profiles at a one and a half centimeter level through an entire drill core. Now that's, that is, that's wow. not the most common. I'd say the most common is every 10 centimeters. So maybe a, a 10X increase hmm. in data granularity. But, but as you can start to generate now this, this data that helps you understand at a much more granular level, how the, the, the outcome of those geological processes, you can start to understand more about those interactions and, and interface points. Now, 
it takes much smarter geologists than me. I simply know that we're bringing more accurate, more granular data, and that that people are looking at that, that understand those geological processes to understand how they can refine their understanding. Um, you know, can, candidly, that's that's part of the reason we we have um, academic partnerships out there. You know, one that, that we talk about broadly is with Colorado School of Mines. Um, and they're out there find, using our technology to find new ways to interrogate the earth and learn more about it. Yeah, those ore diggers live down the street from me, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they were smart. I, I, I noticed you uh, You got your undergrad and your Ute, uh, Utah Ute, I think I saw, so. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Ute, but I, I will say, I didn't, didn't realize I would have dropped in and said, hi, am I, I, I'm a proud, proud father of an ore digger myself, so. Oh, very good. Very good. They had a pretty good football team this year. The last couple of years, actually. Yeah. Uh, JT, let, let me ask you this uh, last question before we let you go. Um, I'm really just curious about your infrastructure, how much computing power this is, this takes and knowing that it's going to take even an incredible, uh, a, a large amount more in the future, the more data comes in, the more computing power it takes. How are you going to keep NVIDIA in business with these valuations that I don't <laughs> this all time? I, look, it, it's, I, I don't know if it's NVIDIA as, as much as uh, maybe Amazon, <laughs> uh, but you know, look, mm. we, let, let, let me answer this way. So we, we deploy around the world. Um, one of, one of the important things for making these technologies works has been work has been the, advancement of the global infrastructure. So being able to set up, link into a Starlink network, combine that with Amazon cloud services gives us a scalability and reach that we simply would not have been able to achieve, you know, even a decade ago. Um, so we, we, have, we have specifically designed our infrastructure to work with trusted partners and be flexible because this is, it is it is a critical feature and um, we do generate massive amounts of data. We have to process massive amounts of data and we have to do it quickly to be valuable to our clients. Um, so so look, we're, we're benefiting from the advancement of global infrastructure, but at the same time, we're very diligent to ensure that we are leveraging the cutting edge of that infrastructure. Um, and, and equally understanding that there's some environments where, you know, either, Either, you know, you don't have a Starlink physically present, you, you know, there's sometimes jurisdictional or legal constraints on how you transmit data, that we have the flexibility to adjust to the regulatory or infrastructure challenges in jurisdictions around the world. Um, because this, this is, hmm. you know, one of the challenges of being a, a early stage company in a global market is you have to be able to quickly move around the globe and mobilize to all parts of the world. And uh, fortunately, you know, we feel fortunate that that we can lean on global infrastructure and that we have the team that has the understanding wherewithal to make it happen. Yeah, it's amazing uh, that this whole process wouldn't have been even comprehensible 15 years ago. I mean, that's how the technology from not only, you know, data collection, but connectivity throughout the world has changed so quickly. It's just been that you know, it's yeah. humbling to think about in hindsight. You know, we're, we're, so. I, I, fortunate is the best word I can come up with. Like it's, it's you know, we 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 sit at this wonderful inner moment in time with the intersection of all these technological advancements. Um, you know, but but to give you a sense, if you were to think about a drilling program, you know, historically we focused on the geologist, the project manager, right? right? To be honest, now we spend as much time with the digital ops team at our client as we do with the the geologist because <laughs> it's one thing to get the, the 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 geoscience right but we also have to be able to get it to fit into systems and collaborate with the other systems that use build the right api so that we become a seamless part of their workflow and their their model and so it's it's just a whole body of work that you know didn't exist or wasn't as critical before that now now is at the forefront of our minds anytime we ramp up yeah. Uh, JT, thanks so much for your time. This was so informative and interesting. I'm glad we did it because it's a nice, uh, uh, you know, doing something different other than talking about uh, poor markets out of the Canadian <laughs> Canadian exchanges. So it's a breath of fresh air. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, we're going to keep following this story and you know keep us informed of any you know you know big discoveries or big wins that Verasio has in the future. 
Ab- absolutely. Well, look, we look forward to catching up in the future. Um, I appreciate I appreciate the conversation. These are the highlights of my day to be able to talk with others who share the same passions. And uh, yeah, and we look forward to, you know, overcoming the challenges that sit in front of us to really be able to bring the critical minerals the world needs and, um, you know, help investors make a buck while they do it. <laughs> well, well, we like the sound of that. All right, everybody, that's a wrap here this week on Mining Stock Daily. Have a great weekend. We'll be back Monday morning with the morning briefing. Be well. <laughs>